things have changed. In some ways they have, but in a lot of ways, sales hasn't changed much since about Mesopotamia. Please stop saying, does that make sense? Particularly in your demos. But the reality is, is that 99% of your prospects that you're talking to, no matter what you sell, do not know what their problems are. I disagree buy. with you. I don't think people buy from people they like. You know, a new CRO or VP of sales comes in, you know, the first thing they want to do is they want to rip and replace what's in Salesforce to their own methodology. What are your thoughts on that? Because it's more yeah. open-ended, right? Nope. I don't want that. I want, I want to know how my service compares to their current world because yeah. that's yeah. what is going to make them buy. Yeah. But it's, like, it's a little bit like working with an addict. And the addiction is the status quo. All right. Have you ever, I want to ask you this question. So whether you're about to pick up the phone to make another call today, another sales call to a prospect, if you're driving down the road to an appointment, if you're in the gym thinking about your, your schedule today, like what meetings you have with prospects, whatever you're doing right now, I want you to stop and think about this question because I know you're thinking about it. Have you ever wondered what the very top 1% of salespeople in your industry, in any industry on planet Earth. You know, the salespeople who make all the money, who get any promotion they want, who have all of the respect of the entire organization. What do they do differently? Well, see, my next guest is gonna answer that question for you. Let me give you a small taste of this man's background. My guest has over 20 years of technology and SaaS experience in sales training operations sales leadership, and sales consulting. He's built, led, and consulted with a wide range of organizations, including startups, mid-sized companies, all the way to top enterprise global organizations. He's also the current director of sales consulting and training for Sales Hacker. You can Google that. And is a regular speaker at the various Sales Hacker events, workshops, and sales stack conferences. Some of the companies he consults include Zoom, Google, Salesloft, Visa, and PagerDuty, just to name a few. Please welcome to the show, Mr. Richard Harris. Richard, how are you? I'm good, man. Thank you. I need to cut down my bio. <laughs> that's, I, I mean, that, I've, I've had that's a, lot, a long wind up, I but thank you of, for having me. Hey, man, I, I will tell you, most bios are about three times as long. I usually have to cut out a little bit. And it's interesting, uh, Google AdWords, that's one of my clients as well. I train for their division. Actually, it's, so. not, it's not AdWords, it's Google Cloud. Oh, so Google it's Cloud, their, okay. Uh, it's, you know, they're the ones who are going up against um, yeah. Microsoft Azure and Amazon Web Services. So right. a, well, as you know, with Google, approach. Google's like 27 gazillion different companies within one company. That's a, totally. that's a whole other podcast about that. Yeah. So, hey, I'm excited to have you on here today. And, you know, with our company, we always talk about, we bring on guests who understand sales techniques, how they've changed, how the consumer has changed, okay? We don't really bring on, you know, people who are still training dinosaur techniques that no longer work in our day and age. So I'm always excited to, to have someone like you on of your caliber, where you understand how to use sales techniques and training that work with human behavior rather than work against human behavior. So I'm pumped to have you on. So let's dive right into your story. I know people are gonna ask, and I want, to, maybe we could give our listeners a feel for your background and really how you've gotten to this point, you're, where you're one of the elite authorities on sales and persuasions. Can you tell us a little bit more about your background and how did this all start for you? Like, how did you learn all these skills? Uh, I think it was with my parents. Um, okay. We'll go all the way back. Um, you know, uh, even in grammar school, I was the kid, you know, that my neighbor was selling candy for high school. I okay. would go buy it and I would take it to my grammar school and then I would upsell it. So I sold Jolly Ranchers probably in about fifth or sixth grade, maybe seventh you were grade. Upselling Jolly Ranchers. Wow. I was upselling the Jolly Ranch packs, right? Um, <laughs> never got caught. Uh, at least I don't remember. Yeah. And, uh, and so I think it started there. Both my parents are in sales. My, my mom sold radio advertising, cable advertising. She's a broker now. Okay. Um, and then my dad was a, an insurance salesman. So it sort of was around me. Business was mm. around me. Mm -hmm. And I think that I'm very lucky that my parents taught me these things. You know, sure. they taught me about 
I've written about this, but they've taught me, you know, I remember the, you know, the first stock I owned at the age of six, I didn't know how much, you know, was Bob's <laughs> big boy. Right. Right. Um, or Texaco gas stations back sure. in the seventies. And so my parents explained this to me yeah. in a, in a childlike way, in an appropriate way. Yeah. And it just stuck. Right. So, um, and so I'm a big proponent of everybody teaching their kids that that's the first thing. Sure. Yeah. Teach your kids how to be financially wise. Yeah. Uh, and give them the opportunity to succeed. So I started there. And then in, you know, by the time I was in eighth grade, I had to make a decision to go to public school or private school. They sent my sister to private school. I said, I'm not going, I'll get kicked out. Sure. So I realized I could sell pretty well when I convinced my parents of that at, at yeah. the age of 13 or 14. Yeah. Um, and then I just, you know, my first job out of college, I worked for the Gap. I thought, wow, selling, okay. cool, you know, jeans and t-shirts out of college. I actually worked sure, for them in sure. high school. So I sort of, that was my appeal. Okay. And I just sort of pro progressed over time into inside yeah. sales and outside sales and okay. eventually worked to, you know, work my way through. And sometimes sure. I got fired. Sometimes I, I succeeded. And now you're here. So, you know, I was on your website earlier this morning at the crack of dawn, I will tell you. And I even noticed it on your shirt. And I wanted to ask you, like, what does neat selling actually mean? What does that mean? So um, to, to your point earlier that, you know, things have changed. In some ways they have, but in a lot of ways, sales hasn't changed much since about Mesopotamia, right? You still have a, a good or service. You still got someone who wants to buy it. Um, and so I came up with this philosophy. It's neither, it's neither a process or a methodology. People can choose how they want to use it. And it stands for need, economic impact, the access to authority and timeline. Because as we moved into the 21st century, I just felt like, you know, Bant wasn't cutting it. I liked Anum for a while, uh, which was sort of making the rounds. Yeah. Uh, Medic I still like, I think is really good. Mm. Um, and so for me, I, my biggest thing is people say, well, which process should I choose? I'm like, you got to find the one that works for you. Don't mm -hmm. choose neat just because you might hire Richard. If you've already got medic or med pick, leave it alone. Like the funniest thing I see, and I don't know if you've seen this, you know, a new CRO or VP of sales comes in, you know, the first thing they want to do is they want to rip and replace what's in Salesforce to their own methodology, which sure. is probably the single dumbest decision I've ever heard. Mm. Right. Unless it's bad, like if it's truly bad, but I wouldn't switch from medic or med pick to something else. You should be able to go in and audit what's wrong before you decide to rip and replace. Sure. And you, you know, you brought, you brought up something that I really talk a lot about. I've actually written a lot of articles on this as well. And I say, you know, Bant is bunk. I always say Bant is bunk. And here's why. Um, Bant is a sales methodology that assumes that each of your prospects already know what problems they have and already have the budget sitting there waiting for you to solve their problems. But the reality is, is that 99% of your prospects that you're talking to, no matter what you sell, do not know what their problems are, or if they know a little bit about that problem, maybe they don't know how bad the problem is, or maybe they don't even know really what the problem is doing to them, to their internal organization, if you're selling B2C to them personally. So Bant is, is coming from a, a process that doesn't really understand human psychology. That was my degree in college, human behavior, human psychology. So with Bant, you're already setting yourself up to really only work with people who already understand they have a problem. The reality yeah. is most people don't understand they have a problem. Let me give you an example of this. The easiest way I could, I, I could give you an example of this. Let's say that you have, um, oh heck, let's say you have a headache. And you're like, you know what? I've got uh, $25 to budget to, to get my headache solved. I'm going to go to Target and I'm going to get some, uh, some Advil, you know, and I'm just going to pop in some medicine and I'm going to solve the problem. But then the headache starts getting worse and you go into the doctor and the doctor says, we need to, we need to uh, have like a head scan on your head, whatever those called, MRIs or whatever. And then they come back and they say, oh my gosh, you have a brain tumor. It's not just a headache. The, the headache was caused by the brain tumor. And oh, by the way, you only have six months to live and your insurance is not going to cover half of this. So you're still going to need to come up with about $100,000. Well, now you know what the real problem is. So do you think you're going to go out and find the budget to actually solve that problem that you originally didn't even think you had? Of course you will, okay? So Bant is really bunk when you try to use that because like I said, you're assuming that each of your prospects you talk to already know what their problem is and they've got budget aside. When they find out, so we, we teach salespeople 
how to become problem finders and problem solvers, not product pushers. There's a major difference in our day and age, right? Because a product, what do most people do? You know, when companies bring me in, typically I say, you know, put me in your shoes. What would it look like to onboard a new salesperson and train me today? And they're like, oh, we've got training. But when we pulled back the curtains, it's really just product training and like a script. That's about it, right? Talking about the features and benefits. And then they go into their pitch and they hope and pray that something they're going to say to the prospect is going to trigger them to magically want to buy from them. I call that hopium. It's like a drug so many salespeople are on, right? So you have to become a problem finder in our day and age where you're, you're asking the right questions at the right time in the conversation that help the prospect uncover problems that they didn't even know they had. Because it's without them understanding their own problems internally, it's impossible for them to convince themselves that they want to buy from you so you can even solve their problems. So that's why I'm always, I don't want to say a critic, but Bant is so dead in the water. It's so 2012. I don't even know. So I want to go into this. I also read on your site, you hate the phrase ROI. Tell us why. So a good friend of mine, I don't know, uh, Rob Jepson, I don't know if you've talked to Rob, but um, you know, he once told me, and I just stuck with me, and I agree, uh, is that nobody believes the R, they only believe the I, okay. right? And I've said for years that you know, Steve Jobs himself could resurrect and come up with the best ROI calculator, and someone will say it's not right, sure. right? Like, you know, the most, one of the most trusted sources, right? Bill Gates, same thing, although he doesn't have to resurrect. Um, so for me, it's about what's the real economic impact of things, meaning, you know, when you talk about, you know, when people hire you or me, you know, if, if they really, you know, I, I do not lead with the, hey, look, you only need to close one deal for me to, to, to cover my training. You know, if I'm selling that way, whether it's my service or anybody else's, you should fire me. Yeah. Like if yeah. you've got a team of 10 people, I should be helping each of those 10 people get 10 more deals this year or sure, whatever sure. your sales cycle is, right? So understanding that economic impact is one piece. Yeah. What you have to do is you have to decide, for me, I go in and I ask, what are we trying to solve? How are we getting there? Yeah. You know, is this saving time? If so, how much time? Yeah. Right. Then equating to them. Now, let's say I can save you 10 hours a week, mm. right? You know, of those 10 hours, if I using my service, do you get eight hours back or do you only get two hours back? Like how right. much time am I really saving you? Right. And then I will turn to them and I'll say, great. So let's, let's say a half, let's say I give you five hours a week back. And I would say, Jeremy, you know, how big is your to-do list? Is it more than seven things? Cause everybody I know has a to-do list. Sure. And I'll say, great. Based on that list, Jeremy, now that you have five hours, 20 hours a month back, what do those things get done faster? And if they're revenue related, how much faster will that revenue come in? Sure. That's economic impact. That's not ROI. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's because ROI is only about that particular tool or service sure. as it's been taught. Yeah. Economic impact is how does it globally, you know, go out? How does it help your entire business? Yep. Right. And so right. that's, that's what I mean by economic impact. Okay. That makes complete sense. You, you hit it right on the head. You know, we teach salespeople, I'm sure like you do as well, that you basically, the, the price is here of your product or service or whatever you're doing. And if you can't ask the right questions, in that conversation to get that prospect to see that if they get the funding for this or the budget for this, they can have this, what they said they really wanted. Yep. If you can't get them that, then they look at this as just an expense or a bill. And they look at like, I'm not sure they can get me the results I want, right? Yeah, I wanna, I wanna push on you a little bit too um, on, on a couple of words that I coach people on. And you know, it's about budget and price. I never use those words. Yeah, I wouldn't use those in a sales conversation for sure. Yeah, so so anytime someone asks me what my price is or it starts to become that, I always I immediately reframe it to commercial terms. Sure. Jeremy, happy to talk about commercial terms. Mm -hmm. Right? You understand the psychology of stuff based on your background. So, you know, that phrase now means that there is a give and get that it's not a price and I'm giving you a widget. Sure. It's that you're paying me and I'm providing real value. And so I don't allow people to use that phrase. I, I mean, I let them that. use it. Yeah, I love but that. Everybody listening, use that commercial terms, yeah. especially if you're in more of a complex B2B. C. I love that terminology. That's amazing. Thanks. So, yeah, so that's just one of those little things I, I always encourage people to do. 
Yeah, and I, and I think it's really important because people buy, you know, there's this old saying, and it's been around forever, that people buy from people they like. And, and partly that's true. You know, people buy from people they like. But in our day and age, people buy more based on the results they feel they can get from you. So I, mean, I disagree buy. with you. I don't think people buy from people they like. I, they I buy, agree. That's where I was going. They buy from people they trust. They buy from people who they trust can get them the best result. That's what I'm saying here. So, yeah. so many sales trainers keep saying, oh, you, you got to get them to like you and talk about the weather and, you know, build a relationship of trust. Yeah. Blah. Everybody knows when you come to their office and you start talking about the game or who won this or the fishing trip that you're just wasting time. People do not have time to hear bunk. They buy so, based so, on. Again, so, so I grew, look, I grew up in the deep south, right? I grew up in Macon, Georgia. Nice Jewish kid from Macon, Georgia. So I, you know, a little different for me. Um, if I'm going into the south, I play the game. Mm -hmm. I can talk SEC football and put on a southern accent and talk, with, talk about sweet tea and barbecue. Yeah. And that's expected, mm -hmm. right? Uh, now, you put me in New York City or Boston. I can't do that. Mm -hmm. I can't try to do that. Yeah. So I think for me, it's about that's how you have to find your authenticity, sure. right? And in both those realms. So I'm not opposed to talk. I agree with you. I loathe the weather. I loathe the small talk, sure. right? You, we got on and, and you started sort of explaining to me what you want to do. And I'm like, dude, just go, just hit roll. We got it. Yeah. And, uh, and, uh, and that's my, that's Richard. Sure. Um, but I also know that you do need to be mindful of the cultures around you um, in, in an appropriate way. Yeah, um, and I love that you understand that people buy, you know, so many salespeople think that still if they can get them to like them, you know, here's, let me give you an example. Grandma comes to you and she's got the newest, greatest vitamin or MLM she's trying to pitch. You really love grandma, but it doesn't mean you're going to buy from grandma. You love her, you like her, but you're not going to buy from her. You're going to buy from the person who you feel that you trust to get you the best result. It's almost the same in politics now. You've started to see these polls have gone crazy the last four, five, six years in these different elections because they'll have likability factor is, oh, so important. And then the person that people don't like somehow wins. It's because they feel that the person, even though they don't like them, they don't necessarily have to hang out with them. They might think they're crazy or an ass or whatever, but it doesn't mean they're not going to vote for them because they feel that that person can get them a better result than the other person. And it's yeah. the same thing in sales. Yeah. I think they, I think the people tend to try and they want to trust the politician, right? And they're willing to give people the benefit of the doubt. And I think it doesn't mean likability doesn't matter, yeah. but I think it it's likability is kind of like a, a big subset of trust. Yeah. It's you got to have some level of that for trust, mm -hmm. I think. Yeah. Um, but again, you're, I, I'm not the psychology expert, I, you know. So. Well, no, you're, you're right. I mean, you're right. Like I said, I mean, and that's one thing I wanted to lead into the next question. Sure. The one thing that every sales rep has to focus on, and you talk a lot about it as I was on your website and everything you talked a lot about is trust, not credibility, not authenticity, not rapport. Why is trust so king in sales in our time? Well, I think all those other pieces add up to trust. Yeah. Right. Um, you know, I think Gong did a survey once and I'm not promoting this. I wouldn't advocate someone to do this, but it's, they did a thing where, you know, as soon as somebody cursed in a call, yeah. right. Everybody relaxed. Yeah. Right. Because now, Oh, now we're being real. Now we're being the real person. Right. You're authentic. And, 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 and let me rephrase that in a very high percentage, that does not mean, you know, again, if I'm calling in the deep South and, and my, my customers are, are churches, I have some clients like that or, or, or clergy or something like that. Probably not the best place to okay. curse. Probably not. Don't the do. place. <laughs> so, um, but I think, you know, the trust thing matters because I think you have to earn the right. That's sort of my other big phrase. Um, I've got a t-shirt called earn the right to ask questions. Yeah. Um, cause you have, that's what I teach is I teach people how to earn the right to ask the questions that need to be asked. Yeah. How to ask them and when to ask them. Give us an and example you, of that. Like, you know, cause that, that's true. You have to earn the right. You have to ask certain questions that cause the prospect to be curious enough to want to engage. Right. Yeah. What's an example. What's an example you can give us? Well, I think so. So at a tactical level, it's all about the open ended questions, who, what, when, where, how, which, maybe why. Right. Right. Um, and understanding that piece and, and getting someone to paint the picture in their head. Yeah. Right. So my job is there's a picture in your head of as a buyer of what you're trying to solve. 
And so I need to get them to help paint that picture for me rather than me painting it for them. Right. Self-persuasion. You just, you're talking about self-persuasion, getting them to persuade themselves rather than you trying to do it. Oh yeah. It has nothing to do with me. God, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's a little bit, you know, and I, and I don't take this lightly, but it's like, it's a little bit like working with an addict and the addiction is the status quo. Yeah. Right. Yeah. The addiction is I don't want to spend my money. Yeah. Well, I can't make you spend it. You've got to, con you've got to realize yourself that you need it. Right. And you know, my job and I think your job and what separates us from a lot of people is we're not trying to manipulate people. You know, I'm the, I'm the first person like early on in my sales conversations, my first conversation, I will say, Hey, Jeremy, you know, here's our goals of this call. By the way, if it's not a good fit, just tell me, like, I promise you won't offend me. I've been doing this a long time. I'm and by the way, if I discover that I can't help you on Jer with something, Jeremy, I'm going to be the first to tell you, and I'm going to recommend somebody else to you. Yeah. And they're going to appreciate right? that. It's almost like if they say, why should we go with you? Well, I'm not quite convinced you should yet. Yeah. You know, so, so, yeah. yeah. The other thing I, I, I talk about too, is that as a salesperson is, and I say this to clients too, these are some of the examples you were, you were asking for is I, I will literally say to someone, you know, I'll say, Hey, Jeremy, you know, this looks like it's going to be a big decision for sales. Mm -hmm. And, you know, go ahead and role play with me. Uh, yeah. I mean, it's, you know, we've got to pull together the budget for sure. Got it. And, and I assume that all eyes are on you since you're the one leading this charge. Well, yeah. Cause if I make the wrong decision, I could lose my job. Yeah. So here's my promise, Jeremy, as we go through this process, my job here is to help reduce the risk you feel in making this decision. Okay. And I hope, I hope that by doing that, you'll choose me. It's possible you won't, but that's okay. But at the end of the day, you need to feel comfortable with that. And I also want to make sure, Jeremy, I'm never, ever going to make you do anything or say anything that makes you look bad in front of your peers. Sure. So you've got that commitment from me as we go through this process. Yeah. So you're, you're basically, de you're detaching yourself. That's what we teach. You have to detach yourself from the expectations of making the sale and instead focus on whether there's a sale to be made in the first place. And they feel that, right? The prospect feels that. Because if you go in and assume like, I know you're going to pick me. And when we do this, we're going to do this and do this. What do they do? Yep. Walls up. Right. And you're competing so think, against the wall the whole time. Yeah. And I think that, you know, I've never phrased it the way you did about detachment and I like it, but I think that detachment allows for the rule of reciprocity to sit in, to come into play. Right. right. Now I've done Jeremy a favor. I've told him that I understand his world. Um, I'm hoping to help lead, you know, really make, make Jeremy feel more comfortable sharing and talking with me. And because I've done that, Jeremy may feel obligated to answer my questions, but he's certainly going to feel a lot more comfortable. He's going to be more open. Questions. He's going to be open, right? To yeah. go deeper. Instead of just, you know, giving you surface level answers, when they, when they don't feel that pressure, the sales pressure, they'll open up and really go under the surface of what really is going on what the real problem is and really not even what the problem is. Cause that's just, that's the, that's the surface, but what's the root cause of the problem? Like what's causing yeah. it and how is it affecting them? Right. Yeah. Emotionally, their emotions or feelings are coming out. I love that. Yeah. Well, well done, my friend. I wanted to ask you this. Um, what's one question someone in sales that's listening to this right now um, can ask a prospect today to get them to really think about their situation, the status quo, and really want to change that? What's one question in your, in your quiver, your arrow, that your arrow is yeah. like? um, Well, it depends on where you are in the sales process. Right, so, and it could be different for any industry. Right. So, yeah, I'm not worried about the industry. This still works everywhere. If I'm at the beginning, mm. or every time someone new comes in, yeah. I always want to reframe yeah. And I'll say, what's driving this conversation today? Mm -hmm. Or I'll lead, use a leading tone and go in and say, hey, Jeremy, you know, based on our previous conversations, this is what we're trying to accomplish in today's conversation. Yeah. Is there anything that's changed that I need to know about mm -hmm. before we start the conversation? And tell us why, why would you ask that? I, I think that's really important, but why would you ask that? What does that trigger for the prospect when you ask that? Well, it, for in my mind, you, you tell me is that it sends the signal of trust, right? It sends the signal of, Hey, yeah, I'm, you know, ultimately I'm controlling the conversation and the agenda, but I'm giving the prospect or the client enough control that they feel like I'm not leading them down the path on a leash, you know, just sort of dragging them. Trying to make the signal. Right. And so 
it and it also establishes a mutual level of respect. Yeah. Right. Well, they, um, they look at you as more of the trusted authority, the advisor, yep. whereas most salespeople they view as just another salesperson trying to stuff their solution down their throat. So they treat you with respect. You're exactly right. So I want to get I want to give people one more tip if you don't mind. Love it. On the other side of it, what should you listen for in your sales calls, right? Mm -hmm. Today. You go on a call today after listening to this. The one thing I always want to hear someone say is, that's a really good question. Mm -hmm. As soon as someone tells me that's a good question, mm -hmm. it means they're thinking. Mm -hmm. And then I need to keep pressing there. It's a huge buying signal. Now, that doesn't mean that they're going to buy you. Sure. But it's a buying signal of their process. Yeah. So anytime you can ask a question that pushes them a little bit to say, you know, wow, that's a good question. You keep pushing on that topic because you've just uncovered a really big surface pain that they don't necessarily realize they have. And now it's up to you to figure out how important that is right. in regards to that. Yeah, you're probing deeper, right? I always talk about it's like an onion. And the more layers you peel off the onion, the more of that core of the person and the prospect and the problem you find out and uncover. But more importantly, who's finding Jeremy, out? You said you weren't going to use these old archaic phrases, man. Don't go with the onion layer peeling. I love the onion. It's so true because you're going under the surface, right? You're pulling out emotion, their feelings, right? Top salespeople, the ones that are the best, always do that. Uh, surface level salespeople are just average. They ask a couple of surface questions, then go in their pitch, and then they wonder why people aren't buying. Yeah, can I, can I give another tip for people? I, I, of course, that's why you're here. Yeah, they're like this is the part, I, this is the stuff I love doing, right? Yeah. Uh, please, please stop saying, does that make sense? Particularly in your demos. Mm -hmm. 99 times out of 100, it makes perfect sense. Mm -hmm. And as salespeople, we're feeling like we need to fill that gap of silence. Yeah. So what I, what I encourage people to say or ask is use that moment. It's a critical moment. It's really good. You do need to catch a breath and pause between slides or, you know, as you shift, but simply just ask, how does this compare to what you're currently doing? That's a good, it, we call those checking for agreement yeah. questions, right? To, to make so, sure you have a pulse on the conversation. Yeah. I love that. That's a, yeah. that's a great question. But stop or, saying, does that make sense? Yeah. Or you can say, are you, are you with me on this or. Oh, no, uh, don't say that either. I, no. Because they're going to say yes. They're never going to say no. It, it depends. It depends. It depends. I, I promise you, I, I've made close to $3 million a year straight commission in my sales career as a W-2 rep. It That's all right. I don't like that question. I, we don't I, have to agree. That's I, the beauty of this. You know, my prospects love that. But it's checking for agreement questions. What we're doing, we're talking about the same thing, just rewording yep. it. Checking for agreement questions where you can say, what are your thoughts on that? Because it's more yep. open-ended, right? Nope. I don't want that. I want, I want to know how my service compares to their current world because yeah. that's what is going to make them buy. I think that's one checking for agreement question, but let's say you're doing a 30 minute demo. You're not going to ask that 27 times because it's too repetitive. People are no, going, but I can ask it in a lot of different ways. Of course. Yeah. But there's a, no, we're in agreement, but different. We want to change up those. I'm just trying to be controversial with you, Jeremy. I want, I want your listeners to go, wow, that guy Richard's really pushing him. No, I love it. No, I love it. I love it for sure. Uh, another question before we end the call, because I know, I know you've got a meeting here. Um, what's, the, what's the best way a salesperson can create urgency in the sale to reduce their sales cycle time, especially if they're in a more complex selling environment? Well, I think that there are two pieces. Most people try to go to timeline, right? Around, you know, what happens if this doesn't happen by such and such a date? What's your driving factor? What's your point of those things? That's a piece of it. Um, and I, th I think you should uncover that. But it goes back to this economic impact. You have to make them realize how impactful this is yeah. in making their decision. So there's another piece that I always do. I, I, I would assume you've done this too, is that one, as we talk about economic impact, we talked about it earlier. Here's the, another side of that is I also need to know, hey, Jeremy, you know, what's your average contract value? Yeah. And let's say it's, you know, let's say it's 100 grand a year. Yeah. And I'll say, great, Jeremy, what's your average sales cycle? Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's six to 12 months, 12 to 18 months. Yeah. Great. Yeah. And what's the lifetime value of your customer? Mm -hmm. And very few salespeople ask this question, you know, and I'll get specific. Does your customer stay three years, four years? Sure. And they'll say, oh, it's three years. And so, okay. So what we're talking about here is a $300,000 decision, not a hundred thousand dollar decision. Sure. Right. And then saying, now, as we do this, are we looking to, decrease the sales cycle or just drive more conversions 
Right. And so all these little pieces it gets add into on economic impact. Yeah, it gets them to think about the economic impact, whereas other salesperson never got them to that point where they yeah. even thought about it. That separates you from everybody else. Yeah. Where can our listeners learn more about you and your training? I really want to know. Oh, I appreciate it. Um, obviously, you can go to the Harris Consulting Group. Okay. Uh, the Harris Consulting Group. I hate how long the name is, but that's just what it is. And by the way, this is legit. I do this all the time. This is my cell phone, 415-596-9149, 415-596-9149. It's my legit number. It's not a burner number. You can text me. You can call me. Nobody ever does. That's why, why I give it out. Um, and I'm also all over I'm also all over LinkedIn. So you can. That's, that's probably the fastest way or easiest way to find me. We have close to 200,000 salespeople and business owners that follow us. So you might actually start getting some calls in nope. tech. Man. I doubt it. <laughs> I doubt it. I love that. <laughs> Richard, hey, it was a pleasure having you on. You're the man. Uh, thanks, thanks for your and Thanks for serving salespeople and companies and really making a difference in people's financial lives. Thanks for being on. Hey, Jeremy, I really appreciate it. Thanks for letting us spar a little bit, sort of try and try and make it a little bit lively. So I, I, I appreciate love sparring. Yeah. Now, if you're serious about joining the top 1%, I mean the top 1%, and you want to experience more training content just like this, click the links right over there. Right over there, they're exactly what you need to see next. You see, I release new episodes featuring top salespeople and sales authorities, multiple six-figure, high six-figure, even seven-figure earners every Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday every single week at 10 a.m. Eastern, 7 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. And if you're new here, do yourself a favor and smash that subscribe button right below, right below, and join our new Facebook group, Sales Revolution. You see, it's free, and there's a link in the description below just for you. We put it there for you. Finally, I make posts on Facebook and Instagram each and every day with more tips and training. So be sure and follow me and turn on your notifications. So make a comment in the first seven minutes to any of my latest posts, share this episode, and there's a very real chance that you're gonna win some killer prizes. And here's the thing, don't sit on the sidelines, don't be like everyone else, get into the game, join the sales revolution, stay active, get involved, learn the right skills, and we will show you how to take your life and income to a level that most only dream about. Stay safe. Talk to you soon.